Welcome. My name is Hamish Elton from HealthCert Education, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar this afternoon, this evening, depending on where you are in, in Australia. Uh, today's webinar is Golden Rules in Skin Cancer Management in General Practice. The presenter today is Professor David Wilkinson. Professor Wilkinson was the, the founding presenter of the HealthCert Skin Cancer Program uh, and has presented the Professional Certificate of Skin Cancer Medicine over 60 times. I think we've lost, lost count. And the course has now been attended by over five and a half thousand medical professionals from around the world. So uh, it's very well tried and tested and David's uh, experience has been shared amongst many colleagues globally. Um, the schedule is, is uh, a 15 to 20 minute presentation followed by a 15 minute Q&A. Uh, please feel free in your go to webinar panel, you'll find a small panel or a little drop down arrow next to questions. If you click on that little arrow, you'll find a panel where you're able to type the questions in. Please feel free to type your questions into the panel during the presentation or at the end. And at the end, I will manage and uh, relay them to David to get his answer. So with that, no further ado, I will welcome Professor David Wilkinson. Well, th thanks very much, Hamish, for that introduction. And good evening, uh, colleagues. Good afternoon. And uh, it's great to have so many people uh, online for half an hour or so. Um, as Hamish said, my name is David Wilkinson. I'm a GP and a specialist in public health, and I've been doing skin cancer in primary care now for, well, longer than I can remember. 2004, I started doing skin cancer uh, in primary care, and as Hamish said, taught many, many courses and literally uh, many thousand GPs in Australia and around the world. And I continue to do it several times a year. I enjoy it very much. And uh, what Hamish has asked me to do this evening is just run through a handful of slides that cover some of the golden rules, as we call them, for GPs to think about when they manage um, skin cancer in general practice. Now, of course, we cannot teach you how to do this safely in 15 or 20 minutes. What I do want to do is use these slides as a way of stimulating your interest um, to come along to one of our short courses this year if you have an interest in this topic. So my um, the first slide I, I want to share is to give you a sense of um, what I teach in my short courses and the key learning outcomes that we cover. Uh, my course is a basic, fundamental course for GPs with an interest in skin cancer. This is the, the basic learning that everybody needs. I teach you how to do a skin check. I teach you about all of the key biopsy techniques, how to do a biopsy. We talk about the need to differentiate between which lesions that we look at are benign or suspicious. I teach you how to use a dermoscope and I teach you what's called the three point checklist, which is the simple way for GPs like us to really learn safely um, how to look at suspicious lesions with the dermoscope. <clears throat> I show you, as you can imagine, many, 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 many images that are benign and malignant and help you differentiate between the two. And we teach you how to excise and repair uh, skin cancers, as well as organizing and running uh, your practice. Um, we do this face-to-face -face teaching and we provide a lot of resources online to support the face-to-face -face teaching um, so you get comprehensive education. Now, as a professor at a university, you would expect me to use an evidence-based approach, and I do. So I don't tell you my opinion, I give you the latest evidence from the Cancer Council uh, clinical practice guidelines and the latest literature as it is relevant to us as GPs. And I give you a very simple, very straightforward, uh, basic way of starting uh, safe practice for skin cancer in Australian uh, general practice. The core of, of what I teach is a very simple protocol that occurred to me after a few years of practice. 
and I realized that the most important decision I was making when I looked at a patient was whether a lesion was benign or suspicious. And it became, nobody else was teaching this way, but it became obvious to me that if I could be confident that a lesion I was looking at was benign, I could leave it alone. But if it wasn't benign, I had to do a biopsy, basically. And so the key decision that we as GPs have to make is not what something is called or what level it is or what subtype it is. We need to detect, determine whether something is benign or suspicious. And that's what I do. Here is an example. There is a pigmented skin lesion. And this lesion is either benign or suspicious. It has to be one of the two. And there are a small number of criteria that we can apply. They're listed here. <clears throat> and I teach you how to think through each of these criteria that make it obvious at the end of that process whether any lesion is benign and can be safely left alone or is suspicious and needs a biopsy. And we do this for pigmented lesions and pink lesions. Now, when you're a GP and you're doing a skin examination, there is a simple, straightforward way to actually do this. And we teach you how to do this in my, in my course. And you would appreciate we need to expose the patient's skin. We need to provide good lighting. We need a form of magnification. Uh, we ask the patient to, to show us the lesions that, that we're worried about. And then we use a very methodical system to do a complete uh, skin check very carefully. And we show you how to do that in detail. We show you how to document uh, the findings in your, in your records and, uh, and so on. With, with biopsy, a lot of doctors get very confused about biopsy. They get confused about the different techniques of biopsy, whether we are removing with the two millimeter margin, whether we're doing a punch biopsy, when should a shave biopsy be used, etc. I keep this very simple. Uh, in my practice, it's either a two millimeter margin excision for a pigmented skin lesion, or it's a, a punch biopsy for, for a pink lesion. And this is what is recommended by the national guidelines. So again, we teach you uh, why to do a biopsy, how to do a biopsy, and very importantly, how to interpret the results uh, of the biopsy. Because sometimes, as you all know, the pathologist sends us confusing uh, reports. <clears throat> it's very important as GPs for us to be able to recognize the common benign skin lesions. And the truth is there are only about five common benign lesions. So I teach you how to recognize each of those benign lesions, and I show you how they can be confused uh, with a skin cancer. Throughout the day-long course, we look at a lot of clinical cases. Uh, this is not a theory course. Uh, this is not about research articles. I use multiple real life clinical cases, cases that I and other um, doctors have contributed to the course, real clinical cases, and walk you through each one of them to show you how to go about a diagnosis and then start a management. So, you know, many of us will have seen patients with a head that look like this one. And, you know, for many GPs in Australia, knowing how to evaluate this and treat this correctly is actually quite tricky. And I walk you through how to do that, the safe steps, priorities, biopsy, treatment, just by way of example. I, as I've said, I teach you about dermoscopy. Dermoscopy is essential if you are going to treat skin cancers uh, anywhere in the world these days. You have to use a dermoscope. It is like the stethoscope for the heart. And so I teach you how to use a dermoscope 
how to attach it to a camera and use a camera. And as I mentioned earlier, I teach you a very simple three point checklist which allows you to evaluate the suspicious pigmented skin lesions that we're worried about because they might be melanoma. I then move into teaching you about all of the common skin cancer conditions that we all see every day in practice. One example is a patient like this. I'm sure you've all got patients like this. How on earth do you safely manage people like this? So we look at dysplastic nevus syndrome. We look at patients like this with a melanoma. We look at patients like this with actinic keratosis and, and related uh, conditions. We look at patients like this who had, um, this patient had a very aggressive squamous cell cancer. Patients like this where things go horribly wrong. And patients like this with a BCC that was misdiagnosed and again went very badly uh, wrong. So I spend a lot of time on the course sharing with you medico-legal cases so that we can learn from the unfortunate mistakes of some of our colleagues that have gone before. Uh, I do a lot of medico-legal work for the insurance companies and the medical boards. So I get to see a lot of these cases and I share them uh, with you so that we can learn from, from mistakes that have been made and make sure um, that they don't happen again. We do a practical surgery session. So all of our students get to practice how to do punch biopsy um, on, on pig belly. Um, we do the same with shave biopsy and we show you video on, on how to do these and then we all practice them together. And we also do suturing, a simple interrupted suturing and buried dermal suturing, so that by the end of the course, every doctor can do a punch biopsy, a shave biopsy, and do an ellipse excision um, and repair. So that's all from me in terms of the presentation this evening. That's taken about uh, 12 or 13 minutes just to give you a bit of a sense of, of um, how I do things in the course and what we teach. And I'll hand back uh, to Hamish now. And I'm very happy to spend the next uh, 15 minutes or so ask, answering anybody's questions at all. Hamish. Thank you, David. That was excellent. Um, and before we go into the questions, and I'll give everyone an opportunity now, if you've got a question, please feel free to type it in. Um, one thing that, uh, Dave, as I mentioned, David's presented this, this course over 60 times and to over five and a half thousand. Um, for, the, for the past 13 years, in fact, since 2006, the format has been the same. And whilst the, some of the medicine and the, the medicine has evolved um, based on uh, learnings and experience, much of it hasn't changed. But what has changed is, I guess, our lives in the last 13 years. I think this course started when there was no iPhones and other phones interrupting our life or in the same year uh, and since then. And the one change that we've made coming up in, in Melbourne is to actually change the course from a two day format down into a one day practical workshop. Um, there's no less content. And in fact, you get David for exactly the same amount of time. What we've done is we really removed, well, taken the non David content and put it online so that you can do watch some of the in uh, the uh, lectures on histopathology, on topical treatments, on the business of skin cancer and on Medicare uh, in, in your own time um, so that we don't take up two days of your weekend uh, and that we still keep the maximum amount of one-on-one uh, -on -one time or one-on group time with, with David in terms of David presenting. Um, so it's now a one-day practical workshop with the same amount of content. Um, David is presenting for that whole day uh, and fortunately with half the half the face to face time and half the venue costs we've also been able to reduce the price by half. Um, so it's the same uh, same theory, uh, the same content just compressed down so it now is available and we're running that on both the Saturday as one one course and then on Sunday as another course. So if you're committed on Saturday in Melbourne you could come on the Sunday or vice versa. 
So that's just a, a, a significant change that's happening as of the uh, event coming up in, in Melbourne. Uh, and that will then be continued on in the events at the Gold Coast, Sydney and Brisbane throughout the year. So whilst the questions are coming in, I'll uh, quickly uh, go to the first one, David. Um, and you've mentioned uh, the identification of benign or suspicious. Um, this question is, when, when would you recommend that a GP should refer a skin cancer patient and not treat in primary care? Um, well, that's a great question. So let me answer it this way. Um, if a lesion, so, so I think it's really important not to try and make a specific diagnosis. The key decision is, is something benign or am I suspicious? And if you're suspicious, we need to do a biopsy. And my view is that any GP in Australia with the correct training can biopsy appropriately almost any lesion in his or her practice. And that's the aim of the course. So I would, I would like to have a situation where all of the doctors that come on my course no longer need to refer a patient to get a diagnosis. So um, if, you, if we think about it, if something is suspicious, it needs a biopsy or it needs referral. I'd like to take referral for diagnosis off the table and give that back to the GP. If a lesion is suspicious, by definition, it should not be monitored. We need a diagnosis. And, and again, the aim of this course is to give every GP the skills and the confidence to do a biopsy and interpret that biopsy result Treatment may well require referral, but I would love to have the situation where every GP can make his or her own diagnosis by being able to do their own biopsy. So these days, with all the advanced treatments that are available for melanoma, for example, almost all patients with melanoma now need to be referred for specialist evaluation because the new treatments are so effective. But diagnosis can still occur very safely in general practice and it can be done quickly, cheaply and safely and, and, and that's the goal. Thank you um, and I might segue into a semi-related question in that case which relates to monitoring which would be what are your thoughts about imaging pigmented lesions so um there's two there's two different um parts to that um monitoring if we define that as taking a photograph and then taking another photograph let's say six months later and seeing if there's been a change that used to be very popular. It's much less popular now. And the reason for that is a couple of things. If you think about it, why are we monitoring? We're monitoring because we're suspicious about that lesion. Now, if you do this monitoring, it turns out that the very large majority of lesions that we monitor are actually benign. And so you spend a lot of time and money monitoring benign lesions. So most people now don't do monitoring anything like as much as they used to. Uh, I, I would never monitor a lesion on a patient. I would always make a decision on the day. Now, the, the exception to that is the patient with the multiple nevi that I showed you. Those need to be monitored. So people with multiple nevi definitely need monitoring. 
people with one or two suspicious lesions need a biopsy. Now, taking photographs is a really important part of our practice, but not to not as a way of avoiding a biopsy. So it, it, it's a little bit tricky, but the safest way to practice is, is still on the basis of making a decision on the, on the day and doing a biopsy for any lesion that you have concerns or, or the patient uh, has concerns about. And the truth is, you can, you can do, any GP in Australia can safely biopsy almost uh, any lesion. And the last thing I would say on that is, in, in my medico legal work, the, the problems arise when biopsies are not done. Doctors don't get into trouble when they do biopsies. They get into trouble when they don't do biopsies. Thanks, Hamish. Excellent. Thanks, David. Still got, uh, still got seven minutes to go without running too, up, too much over, so we'll go to the next one. Uh, a little, little bit of a specific case advice for this particular doctor. I've done a biopsy for a 25-year-old female and the results came back with a potential Spitz melanoma. Would you give me further advice about the next step? The pathology here will send the biopsy to the melanoma clinic in Sydney for confirmation. It, very interesting. So I would... It, it, my answer would depend on whether the biopsy was a complete excision. <clears throat> so if, if any pigmented skin lesion should ideally be biopsied by complete excision. If, if in this case a complete excision was done, then what you've just said is, is correct. What it now needs is a specialist pathologist to look at the slide at the melanoma unit. If the biopsy was not a complete excision, then that's what needs to be done. In other words, the pathologist needs to see all of the lesion to give a definitive diagnosis. So if, if the lesion has been taken off completely for diagnosis, everything has been done correctly. If not, the whole thing should be removed uh, for, for diagnosis. Yeah. Um, just further info came in relating to that. So margins still involved, depth is 0 0.6 clear. Um, I would, um, it's tricky. I, I would, I would re-excise so that the margins are clear. If, if that was me or somebody I loved, I would re-excise. Thank you, David. Uh, and our one or lucky last, uh, given how long the question is, so what have we got? Um, what other equipment should you get other than a dermatoscope for practicing skin cancer medicine? Well, it's a great question. I, I, I think uh, all the, the minimum equipment is two things. You need um, a handheld magnifying glass uh, with an attached light source. Um, all of us, even young doctors, need magnification and good lighting to do a skin examination properly. So. Uh, my view, uh, a good, effective and cheap way to do this is a handheld magnifying glass with a light source as part of it and then a, a handheld dermoscope. Um, if, if that's all you have, that is sufficient to practice completely safe skin cancer medicine in Australian general practice. You do not need expensive, complicated imaging uh, machinery. Just a magnifying glass with light, good lighting 
and a handheld dermoscope. Um, that and, and on my course, I teach you how to use it properly. Thank you, David. We do have time for another one, and this one's another interesting one from the uh, from the audience. Um, should we take a should we take photo of skin lesion and send a pathology report with the photo without patient consent? So I presume the patient consent if there's not patient consent to take to send the photo with the sample. Yeah, so um, a, a very topical question. I mean, in, in the large majority of cases, the pathologist does not need to see a photograph of the lesion, right? Um, in, in almost all cases, it doesn't help the pathologist. In a small number of cases, and they are when the lesion is unusual, um, there is no doubt the pathologist gets more information that way. He or she can then, for example, section the lesion up so that they look at the areas that are particularly suspicious. So my advice would always be to get the consent from the patient and send the image with the pathology request with the patient's consent. You know, these days, the advice from Medicare and from our insurers and the medical board is get the patient's con consent, even if it's verbal consent, and make a note in your clinical record, verbal consent for photograph obtained. If you do it that way, you will be completely safe. Well, thank you. And I'm going to let this last question through because I don't know the answer myself. Um, a light dermatoscope and a wood lamp dermatoscope, is it the same or different? Which is more important? I'm not sure I understand the wood lamp. Is that you've heard uh, of that? Yeah, a wood's light. Um, okay. uh, yeah, they're, they're quite different. And what we want is the, is the, modern, uh, the modern dermoscope. Um, the woods light doesn't help us in this kind of practice that we do. Excellent. All right. Thank you, David. We've uh, liked right to run on time. That's exactly our 30 minutes. Thank you, everyone who joined us today. We will be sending this out as a recording of, the, of this to yourselves, and you're welcome to share it with your colleagues. And if for those who weren't able to attend, it will also get a, uh, a copy. Uh, and if you are interested in uh, learning from David, uh, from what he summarised today, uh, we're running this course in Melbourne at, in the end of February 2021, I think is the date, this, this Saturday. And as I said before, it's now a one-day course. Uh, today is the last day of the early bird, which is the 30-day prior special offer where you save $200. So you can get a, now attend this course on the Saturday or the Sunday for $1,495 is the early bird price. Uh, thank you, David, for taking your time out of your schedule and for everyone else and uh, look forward to seeing you in the future. Thanks, everybody.